So you're Anthony Powell. You pastor a church in Azusa, California. Yep. Part of uh, the greater Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. You and your wife planted that church four years ago. Yeah. Four years ago. Yeah. Four years ago. I was there at the launch. Yeah. Um, me and you have been close since 2002 or three. You have a way better memory than I do. I think it was a long time. <laughs> we both started going to the same church in 2002. Mm -hmm. We hung out for the first time on my birthday of 2003. Mm. We went to the Jay Leno show together. That's right. We went to the Jay Leno. How do you remember that? <laughs> How would you remember that? I remember <laughs> my relationship with you, man. <laughs> I um yeah, and uh, you you continued to get me into trouble for a little bit. Uh, is that how you remember it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we both kind of uh, laid some some stuff in our lives down to follow Jesus more more fully. Uh, continued to be part of the same church in Los Angeles, um, and uh, obviously you're 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 not just one of my closest friends, but you've been coaching me with some ministry stuff because you're smarter with organizational leadership than I. That's legit. This is legit, right? Organizational leadership. You're, you're stronger in that than I am. You've got a, you've got multiple degrees. Um, what are your degrees in, by the way? Theater, dance, media performance, um, a master's in pastoral studies, and I'm a doctoral candidate for a, a, a doctorate in ministry currently. Got, I'm in my last semester. Praise God. It's been a long journey. And you've been you've been part of a um, two year. Um, what do you even call that? A uh, two-year cohort, which was a research grant funded by the Louisville Institute um, to do what's called action research on the subject of racism and lament. Really looking at the intersection between lament and what the Bible says about lament um, uh, and, and what lament looks like in a current modern-day culture um, and as it pertains to racism. Um, how do we um, lament, grieve, mourn, acknowledge um, that this is a problem and this is an evil that still exists in our culture today. And then specifically, what is the church's role in that? Tell me, like, when you, when you see, I mean, let's, let's go back when uh, Ahmad Arbery was mm -hmm. shot in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, you see that. And what, what, what's, what's your response? What do you feel? Uh, it's a very visceral response. Anytime I see these um, images or, or hear these stories, um, for somebody with black skin, um, everyone has one. Um, I find it hard pressed to find anyone, um, at least of the adult age, um, that has not encountered racism that is both systemic and subtle, or overt and very much in your face. Um, and so it's one of those feelings you have where obviously that is racism taken to the extreme in the sense that it results in the loss of life, which is horrific, tragic, and extremely infuriating. Um, and you personify with that. Like, uh, yeah, my first response is like, that's me running down the street. Like there's, there's very little difference. Um, had I been in the wrong place at the wrong time, I would have been Ahmad um, and my family would have been planning my, my funeral. Um, then that is escalated when you hear about the injustice that, that happens after the fact, meaning um, uh, no arrest uh, or no charges, um, and it takes a video going viral for there to be a, some sort of really formal investigation and justice to be sought. Um, and then as, as we've been hearing, um, as many people are saying, which is true, this is just what is seen. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't even account for, I think, a fraction of the stories that are unseen. And then George Floyd uh, happened, and that's caught on video, and you see that. And that's, that's I mean, that's, I don't know, what was that, two weeks after the um, Ahmaud Arbery video was released? Yeah. Maybe not even. Um, and to me, I'm a white dude, and I'm watching this going like, I, again like seriously like what's going on like it it it, it, it was crazy but to you like did, did this did this make you think that there's more systemic racism than you previously thought i guess that's what i'm trying to ask yeah 
So Ahmad Arbery loses his life due to some quote unquote vigilante justice that was completely unfounded as more facts come out. And in a very short period of time, we see the death of George Floyd at the hands of law enforcement, placing his knee on this brother's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. While he says, I can't breathe. While there's a crowd standing on video watching by saying, what are you doing? Let him up. While we, we see a grown man who's got kids of his own cry out for his mom in some of his last breaths. Um, so what I, I believe happened in that moment was because of, also, huh, we're under the cloak of a pandemic. So everyone is on edge. Um, emotions are very much at the surface um, globally. Um, there's this global kind of, um, you know, it's a pandemic that's happening to all of us. And then as I'm hearing it said, like, we're, we're battling two viruses at the same time, at least in the United States. Um, so really what this does for me uh, and when, I, when I'm seeing this happen is, um, I mean, I'm a man of God. So I'm first like, okay, God, spirit of God, racism is a deeply rooted evil that is not new that we see throughout the pages of scripture that is being highlighted and being accented. Um, let's let the justice flow. Let the mercy and compassion, like you can't, I always, I always kind of look at it this way. You can't unsee something. So for many, especially those within the United States, especially those that aren't black, it's like we now can't unsee that. And it's at the surface. And because of the closeness of the two incidences, we can't check one off as perhaps that was just a one off or, or we know we've heard this in the past, but it really doesn't happen that often. They're just like a couple bad apples that are ruining it. You know, it's really, we've taken 20 steps forward and that's just like a one half a step back. But really the way they came one, two, it's like, oh no, no, no. We are not even as far as we thought we were. Mm -hmm. We've got to wake up. This is more deeply rooted, more systemic um, than perhaps we've given it proper attention. And the black community is saying, Yes, like this is what we've been saying the whole time. And every time we've been screaming it, um, it feels as if, okay, and then you get the, you're the angry black man stereotype. Then you get the, oh, but look how far we've come. Then we get to, uh, even some of those things that, that, that even I could um, think and go, well, we had a black president, like, okay, like, come on, like, did I ever actually believe I'd see that in my lifetime? Like, racism um, is really, if not on its way out, almost there, where the black community is crying out and saying like, okay, no, it's not. Like, it's just taking on a different form. We haven't gotten to the root of the issues that we face. Um, and if you look at any of um, uh, the research and the statistics on the black community, we are on the deficit and the low end, the disparaging end of progress. Although we've used our hands, although we've used our effort, our intelligence, our contribution to build this country. Um, it, it, black, people, black, uh, black lives are, are less likely to be educated, are, are more likely to be impoverished, are, are definitely our prison systems are overrun with African-Americans. I mean, the, the, the statistics go on and on. And have we not taken a step to say, why is that? Yeah. If we've come so far, why is the number? They're not like slight. They're, the gaps are huge, huge. I just heard a recent statistic that if you are white with a high school education, you're 10 times more likely to make more money than a black person with a, with a graduate degree. Hmm. But then people are like, oh, they're just trying to take advantage with affirmative action. Really, um, it's, it's not an equal playing field. And that's just one example. Um, and and every, with every fight for progress, every fight for justice, there are those that are on the other end of the spectrum that feel like this battle has already been won and, the, and we are already operating on equal footing. And therefore, what's the big deal? What are we so doing? Yeah, so 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 for a white person who may or anybody really, I mean, I, I hear I hear in the political 
discussion. I hear black people on 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 some side saying, "Hey, we got we got we got equal opportunity. We've we've like there's there's nothing the law is not allowing us to do that it's allowing other people to do." And 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 mm-hmm. so let's let's you know, and telling the black community, let's stop, let's stop you know saying mm-hmm. that we're being held back kind of thing. So for somebody help help you know help explain how the generational um how the laws in the past are still affecting the present it's it's, there's a battle on several fronts um i think um obviously being a man of faith and someone that believes in the the power of the almighty god we got to realize that racism is 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 an evil that plagues our world it's not just a, a a governmental legislative thing it's a heart issue and so even when and progress is made in legislation and much more progress needs to be made um, and and, I'll, and I'll, I'll give an example in a moment. Um, at the end of the day, if treatment isn't fair and isn't equal, and we know that, then more has to be done at the heart level. Um, there's a study, and I, man, I, I forget her name. It's an activist that was given, and I can find it for you. Um, I want to say it's like Jill something. Um, where, uh, and I think we spoke about this the other day, where she's sitting in an auditorium full of oh, white yeah, people. yeah. Um, and she asked the question um, of all the white people in this auditorium, um, hey, raise your hand if you would like to be treated in the same way that the black people in our country are treated. With the same, if you would like to be given the privileges that black people have given, not a single hand goes up. And so she essentially asked the question, then how is it okay for us to sit here and be okay with the fact that we are living in a culture and a society where there is not equal treatment for people of color. Um, It's it's some of those deeper questions that I think we need to ask. It's like me asking my wife, okay, so um, let me ask you this, Chris, you have three brothers. Um, Have you ever had an incident with the cops where you were walking with your three brothers and they thought because you were walking together that you were in a gang? Nope. I did. We had, we had, we, me and my three brothers were taken to our house, escorted by the police walking home from school to tell, once we got to our door, the cop says, hey, we found these three kids loitering. And one, and one of them says they live here. And for, to my mom say, all three of them live there. They're brothers. Well, they're not, you're, they're not supposed to be loitering. They're brothers. They're walking home together. What would you suggest them do? And to have him literally be caught off guard and almost say, well, for the sake of the no loitering laws, they may need to walk on opposite side of the streets to get home. Excuse me? Holy cow. And that was, that was, that was in Southern California? That was in Southern California, Oceanside, California, um, in the 1990s, because there is this thing called, you know, uh, black chattel, which is like a, a phrase that is, that is that essentially means that black bodies, black male bodies are seen as property to be owned and are often seen as a threat or a violent rep- weapon to those who aren't of color. Like the, the sheer fact that I'm black causes people to be uncomfortable. This is a, uh, that's Cheddar, our, our dog. Our um, new dog. Our new dog, our new puppy. Dude, uh, that, that was fast. Yeah, he's growing. Um, um, yeah, yeah. T- sh- share about the thing with the um, the flower lady. Um, so that and that happened within the last, uh, I want to say, eight months. Um, uh, it's another example of the, of the racism that 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 we face. I'll, again, speaking for myself, not for all black people. Um, story goes, um, my, my daughters are doing a father daughter dance. It's our first one. I'm really excited about it. It's something that I've been excited about it for a while. Uh, I get to be the best dad on the block because I don't get to just roll in with one date, but two, cause we have triplets. So I have two girls, um, coming back from the gym for our big date that we've been planning for weeks. I want to get my daughters a simple corsage because it's a big formal fancy dance. And I want to, I want to you know, treat my baby girls. And, and going to this, uh, this shop in Glendora, which is a, a, a city over here in the San Gabriel Valley, walk into the flower shop. Um, and the, the, the lady at the counter is helping another couple, another family um, who is buying a floor arrangement, taking her time, speaking kindly, helping them pick out, making sure they find the most exquisite, pristine um, arrangement 
that they could for their occasion. And then um, they leave and I step up to the counter and say, hey, what's going on? Mind you, I'm this brother with earrings and dreadlocks coming from the gym. So baggy clothes, sweatpants, you get the picture. Uh, may have even had on a hoodie. I don't remember exactly. Um, and the complete demeanor changes instantaneously the minute I go to the counter. All of a sudden, her eyes are shifty. I can tell she's checking to make sure that there are other people in the flower shop with her. It's a small flower shop. Um, and becomes seemingly nervous. And as I begin to ask, hey, in my cheery self, oh, it's so exciting. Oh, here's what's going on. I want to buy some corsages for my girls and da 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 da. Um, I would love to hear some suggestions and to her response saying uh, simply like, how would I know what you like? I'm like, uh, excuse me? Well, do you have any idea what your girls like? Um, and, and that was only after when I walked up to the counter and her first response was, was to me is, can I help you? As if I was lost, as if I didn't know where I was supposed to be. Um, she took 10 minutes, I'm not putting anything on the story, I'm not exaggerating, 10 minutes to help the person in front of me pick out their flower arrangements. She wasn't willing to give me five seconds. So as I began to explain, okay, well, one of them, favorite color is pink, one of them, well, do you know what kind of flowers they like? Um, no, sir, this is not like, usually people will come in and pre-order this kind of stuff. This is not something that we just make on the spot. Um, they can be pretty expensive. Um, and I th you may be better off going to the Vons down the street and just getting some nice flower and figuring it out there. Um, and this is the reality of a person with skin color that looks like mine. Um, sometimes it's overt like that, which to me and that I was, it was clear <laughs> um, that I was being discriminated against for the color of my skin. Um, and she didn't even want to deal with me. She didn't want to want to take the time of day um, to treat me with the same level of kindness and humanity. She treated the white customers that were just in front of me. This stuff still happens on a regular basis. I still get um, followed by security if I walk into any kind of like high-end store and sometimes a low-end store. I know if I'm going into Ross, the security guard has got one extra eye out on me. Um, mm -hmm. But not, it, not if you're with your family or with your kids, correct? It's, it's a lot less if I'm with my family and with my kids. Um, why is that for folks who may not? Um, my assessment, which I, I, I mean, I, without knowing and directly talking to these people or these institutions, but yeah, my assessment based on experience is um, uh, a, a black male walking the streets by himself must be up to something or, or causes for suspicion right away. And that is embedded and embreeded into our culture. They are a threat. There is a higher opportunity for violence. That is what we see in the media. That is what is portrayed on the news oftentimes. And so, especially if you don't have regular interaction with the black community, I'm not talking about with your black friend. Praise God, we have black friends. Praise God, we have black family members. But if you do not have regular engagements or interactions with the black community, you can have a different assessment of what that is. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. So all this, all this happens, George, George Floyd, Floyd is killed. You, you, you put a post up on, on social media last, it was Sunday morning. It was mm -hmm. Sunday morning. Or mm -hmm. I, I, it was Sunday morning when I saw it. Maybe you put it up Saturday. You had gone to the Azusa Police Department. Mm -hmm. We showed it in church saying, mm -hmm. you know, I ain't gonna be bitter. I, I, I went down to, sh to show these guys that we're, we're I, I'm, I'm behind them. They got my support. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, why, why is your response different than a lot of others' responses, which is, you know, which, which seems to be, and you correct me if I'm, you know, going mm -hmm. too far here, which seems to be reacting to racial prejudice with, with law enforcement prejudice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, especially with uh, the current state of the situation that happened with George Floyd, there's an understanding of, uh, understandably, there's a demand for higher accountability with law enforcement and, and, and with the egregious actions that just happened. 
and and that we me as a as a civic leader and as a pastor like i have a relationship with my police department i know these people i worked with them um they're good people um but are getting um um uh, man they're they're getting very harshly judged treated based on the acts of these four law enforcement that that basically stole the life of George Floyd. So it was my attempt and my desire to express love and that, and that act of hate towards them. Um, and in doing so, I knew that I had a unique voice to do it because I'm a black man. And so me saying like, I'm, I'm for law enforcement being able to come home to their families at the end of the night. I'm not for throwing acid at their faces during uh, what is meant to be a peaceful protest. I'm not for saying that one cop equals all bad cops. Uh, understanding that we, uh, in my opinion, there is an over-policing problem. In my opinion, uh, I've, I've dealt with um, police officers and racial profiling and, and, and the impact, the negative impact that that can have on a black man and on the black culture. Understanding that these things are real and I'm not diminishing that there is a huge problem. We all saw it. George Floyd lost his life because some police officer put his knee in his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds while the world watched and did nothing. Like, this is a problem. Um, so not diminishing that, not diminishing that great things need to be done, but also not willing to, to, uh, to, to kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater, if you will. So I make this post um, where I go to the, my wife and I go to the Azusa PD. We bring them some goodies. We say, hey man, we love you, we support you, we realize these are very hard times and we want you to know that I'm not holding you um, responsible for the acts of other people. Um, I, I, I believe that you desire to see justice and all those things because again, I have a personal relationship with them and I, we begin to engage in a very heartfelt, meaningful conversation, which I thought was gonna be a very quick exchange, um, turned in a very longer conversation about how those those cops do not represent them. They wouldn't even call them law enforcement. They kept saying, gentlemen, we don't even call them officers because they, they forfeited that when they decided to go against the oath that they took to protect and serve the people within their community. Um, I post this, I feel really good about it. Um, why? Because I believe I'm doing <laughs> what the Bible instructs, um, which is to offer love and kindness, bless those who persecute you, even though they weren't necessarily persecuting me, and, and stand for righteousness and stand for justice. Um, and then I get some pushback from those within my own community. Um, I, one of the quotes that I put on that post was uh, a quote from Martin Luther King, um, hate cannot chase out hate, only love can do that. And to which I got a response from um, somebody within the African American community that says, "Oh wow, really, bro? So insensitive, so pulled out of context. Um, you should really think about the timing in which you're going to choose to say this. That's not what this is about right now. This is about bad cops um, acting horribly, which again, absolutely would agree with. But the sentiment that you know, one bad cop, all bad cops, is something that I will not buy into." Um, and, and something that I will not co-sign, uh, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, and do you yeah. think they, they would say that that person, or would they just say that you putting the emphasis on the police in the midst of a tragedy was, was, was wrong and insensitive, or do you think they would, that person would come back and say, no, the, the, the police can't be trusted as a whole broad, broad stroke. Something's got to be done about all of them. Both. Um, really? There would be some people that saying, hey, man, wrong timing. Um, that's not what we're, we're, we're choosing to highlight. And then there would be a, some people that would say, like, one, one bad cop, all bad cops. And I've heard that say at a protest, at that protest that I was talking about earlier, somebody stood up and said that very sentiment. Yeah, you can't trust any cops. They're all bad. Um, to the person that would say the timing is wrong, um, I'm a man of God. I see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I see him coming to get, get arrested. I see his boys, his crew getting riled up, angry, slicing off the ear of a soldier. And I see Jesus in the middle of that violence, taking his ear, healing it, and saying, this is not the way that we go. I see my savior hanging on a cross with a crown of thorn on his head after being flogged and spit at, um, looking up to heaven and say, forgive them, Father. This is, this, they do not know what they do. At the end of the day, what I see within the pages of scripture is there is no greater act of love that can be given than during an act of hate. Um, it was a very intentional statement. The power of supporting the police would have been weakened 
in any other time that I would do it. Um, I was making a statement to say, I'm not trying to diminish that an grievous injustice happened, but I'm not of the, I'm not, I'm not a proponent of hate and violence yeah. towards the police at any time. It's not okay. And that's what they were getting. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to stand up there and say, down with the police. Um, I'm going to stand up and say, okay, down with injustice, police need to be held accountable. But that doesn't mean that all police are bad. Yeah. And, and, and then recently, just the other day, you, you went to a Black Lives Matter... I went to a protest for what I thought was a Black Lives Matter, the actual movement protest, but it, it turned out to be not that. Um, uh, a flyer was disseminated in my community. Um, it was going to be a, a, a march from one park in my local community near my church to the actual Azusa City Hall. So all this is a, really a rock's throw from my church and understanding, have, having watched the news over those last couple of days when people were looting, people were rioting, people were burning churches. Um, I felt like, A, I wanted to be a part of the movement because I believe in it, but B, because of it's in my city and it's literally going to be by my church. And if someone's going to get just straight up, if someone's going to walk by my church and try to burn it or loot it, I'm going to be there to stop it because uh, it is sacred ground. So there's uh, several, several different reasons why I wanted to be there. Um, and several people within my community had let me know about it, asked if I was going to be there. I, I had a, a church members that were going to be there. It's important that we were there. So me and my wife went there. Um, we showed up. We're in the parking lot. People are gathering. Hundreds of people are gathering. We're in this parking lot. And it's clear that there is no leader or no organizer present. So it, it was supposed to start at noon. It's now 1210. It's now 1220. It's going on 1230. And we're all standing there looking for leadership. At that point in time, there are also some clear agitators that had showed up. Um, people that had came that were clear had um, had intentions of escalating the situation, maybe even to a point of violence. Um, you could see by some of the signs that were made, FTP, I don't think I need to go into what that means. You can figure that out. Um, and other things that were just saying, hey, this was also, their, their intentions was to make this an anti-police protest. Now, because of my relationship with the um, police department of the Zuzu PD, I had called the police of, chief of police. I have his personal number. He calls me. I call him, let him know what's going on. He'd already heard about it, and he was glad I called. Um, he wanted to be introduced to the organizer if they ever turned up, which they didn't. He sent a police captain to intercede and do that to let them know, like, we believe in your, your right to protest. We actually want to make sure that you have um, a peaceful protest. Um, uh, be alongside you to make sure that you guys get to exercise your, your, your right to protest. Um, but let us know that when we were going to come up on City Hall, we were going to see, you know, the police cars. We we're going to see the MCAT, which is like, think of like a big um, bulletproof tank. We were going to see police in full helmets, riot gear, what we see on TV. That was the scene we were going to march onto when we got up to City Hall um, because they had to take every precaution based on what was going on. Um, so I got it. And he wanted to let the organizer know that that's what they were going to see to not be emotionally, uh, you know, um, uh, heightened by it, but just realize that they were actually there for us and just for our protection and the protection of the property and the police department. Um, 1230 comes around, no organizers show up. I see that there was a leadership vacuum that um, the, the somebody uh, uh, I feared an agitator was then going to take a lead of this protest and it was gonna go south, left, real quick. So I step in, I kind of scream out, hey, is there anybody from the Black Lives Matter movement that organized this protest? Nobody speaks up. I give it plenty of time to wait. Um, in this crowd, because of diversity of, of this, our particular community, it was primarily Hispanic community, um, but a very diverse crowd, mainly young people, I think, which is what we're seeing similarly throughout the country. Um, so being one of a hundred in, in, a, in a crowd of hundreds of people, maybe two handfuls of black people, um, I just decided to step in and, and bring some leadership. It was not how I wanted my day to go. It was in fact, I was shaking my fist at God a little bit like, really? I've never even been to a protest, let alone lead one. Um, You've never been to a protest? I never been to a protest. This was my first one. I was very excited about it. I'm like, here I go, look <laughs> at me making history. Like marching with my people. I'm ready to sing, we shall overcome, let's do this. Um, and ended up, uh, uh, essentially turning it into a prayer meeting to start it off with prayer. So I hear, introduce myself, pastor, local church. I'm ready to march. Um, I invite you to march with me. 
um, since the organizers aren't here, prayed, and then we began the march. Um, we got up to City Hall, um, took a knee of silence for the eight minutes and 46 seconds that George Floyd um, was mm. under the, having a crushed throat under the knee of an officer. Um, mm. Had some very really powerful, like sacred moments, people coming up expressing their pain. It was chanting, it was signs, it was the whole deal. It was pretty wild, pretty wild. And then there were some moments of unrest. We did have a beautiful young black sister who stepped up and, and, and expressed her great disappointment and how that day had turned out for her. I thought I was coming to a Black Lives Matter movement. I'm upset that whoever organized this didn't show up. I'm upset that our meeting got hijacked. Um, and now, that, now we have someone over here telling us what we should believe and what we should think about the police. F the police. Um, they're the enemy. They're the reason this all happens. One police, one, one bad police, all police are bad. Like, went for it. You're getting some chants from people in the crowd. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I saw that this was... Uh, going to go the direction that I did not want it to go. Um, and so I just took a stand. And, and in that moment, um, I, I really believe the Holy Spirit gave me the right words to say. Um, but essentially, I wanted to honor her pain. She, has, she was very angry, very hurt. And I shared a lot of that hurt and that anger with her. The way that we responded to our anger, the way that we responded to our hurt is where um, things got different. Didn't want to make this a debate or a, a place where she was in any way humiliated or feel like um, her pain was not affirmed, did the best I can while being in a crowd of hundreds of people to not do that. Um, had a heart for her, a young girl, um, but wanted to make sure I expressed my point of view. Um, if I was able to deescalate the situation. Um, there was another black girl, praise God, that stepped up, um, held, holding up a sign saying, we want just mercy, um, and, and shared her story that her, her dad was a police officer and she's black. And so that really took the air out of some of the earlier arguments where she's like, hey, and, and, and so when I, essentially when you hear one, one bad police, all bad police, she's like, this is a black man and my, my dad, I expect him to hold those accountable. We're tired of seeing our black brothers murdered on the street. But I also got to realize at the end of that day, my dad comes home and takes off his uniform and he's a black man too. Um, and we all want mercy. And there are cops that want justice too. Um, there are cops that aren't out there doing these things that these four um, cops did. Um, and so that was helpful. Um, but here's what I walked away with that scenario with that, that really broke my heart. Um, and, the, and the young black woman who was angry at the police and angry um, about the, how the protest was going, she made the statement, um, essentially, why is the church here? This is not their fight and i thought wow church as a church what have we done i realized in that moment that she was misinformed the civil rights movement was led by a man named reverend dr martin luther king the church has always been on the front line of justice in this country. The church was on the front line of the abolitionist movement. The church was on the front line of women's suffrage. The church has always been on the front line of justice. And somehow in this young lady's generation, she had received the message that justice issues were to be separated from the church that the church should not be involved in seeking justice in any way, shape, or form. The minute you bring beliefs, the minute you bring prayer, the minute you bring God into it, that somehow the church has overstepped her boundaries. That's our fault. What in the world? And so it was in that moment I knew, okay, God, something had shifted in me. Um, we had as a church, I'll speak for myself because I, I do not want to defame the bride of Christ. I love the church. <laughs> I've given my life to her and I will continue to do so. I'll speak for myself as a pastor of a church. Um, in, in moments of perhaps apprehension to weigh into political issues have then given up the territory to say, hey, as a church, I can stand on this issue. Um, whether it's out of fear of getting into politics that I don't fully know the, all the nuances to, what, whatever. 
um, for whatever reason, um, my church has not taken a strong stand on, on issues that have come across um, my desk in my world that I need to take a stronger stance on. And because of that, there are people that I'm leading, there are people in our world that think that um, issues like like this are no place for the church and that my friend is wrong and has to change you you have you are taking a stance a stance an, an individual stance on a public platform with your church and with social media you have shown public support for the police department then you go to what you think is a black lives matter thing that you end up leading um what but, but but like the church as a organization, the organization that you're leading, what do you think that looks like? I mean, you hear a lot of this rhetoric right now, like, hey, we all need to weigh in the conversations, like silence is the new racism. Um, and to some extent, um, uh, I agree with many of these sentiments. Here's where I weigh in, and that may be a little nuanced. Um, I truly like love is the answer to hate that there is a level of grace and compassion that has to be given to invite people into the conversation that will lead to action i do believe that a conversation isn't enough it can't just stop here it can't we can't just acknowledge that racism exists and then go back to life as normal there has to be an action step to do something within our own context i absolutely 100 percent believe that i also want to give room for this like as a church god calls us to different passions, different things. He breaks our heart for the injustices that he breaks our heart for. I, be, I believe that. And I'm not saying that racism isn't, um, I believe that, again, I've said it already, racism is an inherent evil that we all must face as a church, as the church entirety, big C church. Then we need to pray and ask God the question, what is it that you're asking us to do what role are we to take what action step are we to make in order to rid our world of this inherent evil the evil of racism and take a step um, i like most people wish there was a 12 point plan to end racism that we can all say oh we get to step one and then we knock that out step two i do think it is a combination of legislation and combination of discipleship i um, discipling a man's heart to be more like Christ that will uproot racism so that we can see God the way the world sees it. Um, the Bible is very clear. When we, go to, when we go to heaven, there will be creatures of every tribe and every tongue. What does that mean? Like God created race on purpose. This isn't like a, oh, happenstance mistake that we are all created in his image to reflect his goodness and his beauty, to reflect a creative God. That being said, when when we hear the term black lives matter or well don't all lives matter like yeah of course all lives matter that's not the point if black lives don't matter all lives don't matter and we can all clearly see that in our culture in our nation right now black people are treated as if their lives don't matter george floyd ahmaud Arbery, the list goes on there are just two in a myriad of names that have lost their lives because they were treated as if they don't matter, um, which is why there's being a, an extra focus put on black lives matter. Let's agree about that. Can we just say that black lives matter and not think that it takes away from the fact that your life matters? Because it doesn't. It's accenting that there is a disparity in the way that black lives are treated compared to other lives. Um, so what am I gonna do as a pastor? I made this promise to God myself. I'm going to, um, with every act of hate, I'm going to respond with an act of love. So I saw an act of hate by the police force that resulted in the loss of life, the loss of the life of George Floyd. So I was going to combat it with an act of love. I was going to go to the local police force that I knew and, and extend an act of love to try to combat that act of hate. That's a, that's a campaign, that's a protest that I have chosen because that's what God has asked me to do. Um, and other churches that may be like, well, I'm going to invest resources, I'm going to partner with the black community closest to me and just say, hey, 
What do you guys need? How can we support you? How can we stand with you? We're willing to do as little or as much as you. We're not gonna try to claim that we have the answer or that we can solve this. We're just wanting to let you know that we're here and we wanna be a part of moving the ball further down the street. We wanna be a part of the solution in very tangible ways. Help us partner with you and, and, and blessing this community. Like, I can do that. I can ask the, the, the black people within my own community, hey, I see you, I love you, I'm praying for you. What can I do to show that I wanna support you in whatever you're going through right now? Recognizing that our whole nation is ablaze, figurative and literally right now because of the recent events. And I wanna be a part of the solution. I do not wanna be a part of the problem. And I do not want this thing to just uh, kind of grow, go right on by us, roll right on by us like the latest news story. But that I want to continue, uh, continue to invest in seeing that the black community is celebrated, not just tolerated, is moved forward and not held back. You're somebody who I, I know loves the church. You always have. You always have. Um, I don't know if I've ever heard you say anything bad about the church as a whole or any particular church. Um, I know that you see yourself, your identity is first and foremost as, as, as a Christ follower, one who's been purchased by Jesus's blood, um, more than being a black man. Mm -hmm. um, but when you see injustice to the black community, obviously that as an individual in the black community, that, 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 that riles your soul up. Um, but do you, do you feel a tension between wanting to fight for justice for the black community and uh, your call to pastor a church and keep people together in unity? Like, do you, do you feel a tension in your soul of like, okay, how do I, is, is there a tension there? Absolutely. Um, like, who do, how do I identify myself? I'm a, first and foremost, a child of God. I'm a son of the living King, an inheritor of, of the kingdom of God. Um, and a part of my identity is I'm black, um, that they, they, they all work together. That's the way that God designed it. And so even when you hear those terms, like, you know, color blindness, which, sure. um, which I give so much grace. I understand the sentiment. What someone is saying is when I don't see color, I don't see you as black or white. I just see you as my brother in Christ. That's, like, wife, that's like my wife saying, I don't see you as a man. I just see you as a person. It's like, what? You don't exactly. see me as a man. Right. Um, exactly. And so I'm careful because I don't want to add to the hostility of sure. the racial issue. I get the sentiment behind it. These are good people doing a good thing, wanting to say, I see you as my brother and I wanted to treat you with the equally in the way that I would treat somebody that's not of color. That's essentially what their heart is saying. But my response is in the most loving way, please see me as black. Please don't see me as colorless. That's just weird. Yeah. Um, um, uh, being black is a part of me being a son of God. It's the, how God created right. me. Ex exactly. As you said. Um, um, and when you said, yeah, I tell, see me as a man. Exactly. Um, understanding that, we need to have more what I call brave conversations where someone can know that they can weigh in with their preconceived notions, with their biases, with their racism um, in a environment where we're coming together to move the ball forward, to not be so fearful of not saying the politically correct thing that we just are paralyzed and we're all stuck in the same place that we've been stuck for Hundreds of years. Well, like we have to, yeah. Yeah, we have to be able to just like, okay, I, I said, let's, let's just have a brave conversation. I want you to feel like you can say anything, ask any question, and I'm not going to say, because you said that, you're a racist. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, uh, I don't even know what to call. Are you black? Are you African-American? Do we say colored? Uh, uh, can't, do I say, what's up, my nigga? Don't say that. Um, like, uh, like, what? I don't even know what to say. Can I touch your hair? But I heard you're not supposed to touch somebody's hair. So, so um, if, if I assume when I'm going on the basketball court that I see a brother and I would pick him over the white guy, um, am, am I racist in that way too? Um, like, like, let's just have these conversations. Let's just put it out there. Um, 
so that we can know one another and so that we can better understand one another. Because here's the truth of the matter is, which is why I always say I can't speak for all black people. Because if you had a couch here with three other black guys, you all could ask us the question and we could have completely different takes and stances on the same question. Yeah. Like this is so deeply rooted, so complicated, so layered, so nuanced. There isn't one clear cut answer in many respects. There's some, there is some basic right and wrong here in my heart. But when it comes to understanding this thing called racism and how it's impacted our, our culture, both black, white, and otherwise, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's complicated, but we can't be so intimidated to go into those deep waters that we just don't get wet at all. No, that, 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 that's good. I, and I think a lot of white folks need to hear that. I mean, I, dude, just tackling this subject, there's a little bit of a, um, and I don't know if it's, if it's the internet and social media that has, obviously there's, a, there's good to it. We wouldn't mm-hmm. be seeing videos that we're seeing that go viral, right? I mean, that's the good. Um, yeah. But everything's a statement and then a reaction to the statement and then a reaction to that reaction and bang, bang, bang. And there's, there's very little trust it seems being built when, mm-hmm. when it's, when it's online and it's in, and it's in social media. And, uh, and, and that's, that's what seems to be, I don't know. That's my concern is that ev- people are going to be afraid to say something lest they get some social, you know, some scathing response on social media. So maybe I shouldn't say anything at all. Like I want it to come from my heart. I want to understand. And, and if, and if my process of understanding means I say the wrong thing or ask a dumb question, that risks me being labeled as as a racist or or racially prejudiced or biased or whatever, then uh, I might be tempted to to not even ask the question, which could lead to a bit bridge being built. But my fear of being labeled a racist is keeping me from actually building trust. You know what I'm saying? I absolutely know what you're saying, and you articulated it very well. Isn't that interesting? That that is the problem um, that we're all facing right now, but especially heightened if you are not black like that's where i think the enemy is gaining ground like he's silencing the voice of the church and he's silencing the voice of just believers and those who love god i filter everything in this way i'm one of course i want to be sensitive to the times i want to operate in wisdom and judgment um i i want to be careful in a time like this to not just be so cavalier and so flippant that i don't take into account the sign of the times. Absolutely. All of us need to do that. Black, white, otherwise. Um, It would be idiotic not to. That being said, I want to filter my actions and my speech through the lens of a Christ follower. Ultimately, I need to do what God is asking me to do and things that represent the heart of Jesus and how I approach this issue or any other. Racism is such a deep evil that the more it can, it can breed fear around it to keep us silent, the more it advances and the more it wins. I completely understand what you're saying. I was at this protest where um, it was primarily 90% more than that of the people that were marching were not black at all in any shape or form than to get to the city hall where a black woman stands up and says why are all the why are we letting all these people who aren't black speak this is about black lives this is about our voice they need to shut up and listen and i saw everyone there that was not black go wait wait wait. so am i not supposed to be marching with you am i not supposed to be but i thought if i was silent that was a racism racism so when i want to stand with you and say yes your lives do matter now i'm being told that i'm like they have been placed in a lose-lose situation. You lose if you don't say something, and you lose if you do say something. Um, and I'm like, that's exactly where racism will have its day. It's going to shut everybody up, and so only hate can rise to the surface. And then we get phrases like, you know, all this, that, or the other, all any group is bad, which is not the heart of God. What it's, without, that's Christian cheesy cliche, but how would the spirit of god how would jesus respond in this situation like what would he do you know um how am i supposed to model my behavior how am i supposed to lead my family my church my organization 
I'm supposed to lead it in a way that seeks the glory of God over the glory of man. And so when I took that picture with those cops, I had to, on my face that morning, get with God, take in all the, th- uh, take in the sign of the times, want to operate with wisdom over worry. I was having to filter through all those things as you did. But what brought me to the final conclusion is when I go and meet my savior face to face, do I think he's going to condemn me for encouraging the law enforcement in my community to continue to fight for justice, to bring down um, um, the oppression of any people group and to speak up when you see it, but to know that I'm for you and that I love you. Do I think Jesus is going to be like, dude, what in the world? How dare you? Wrong answer, wrong move. I just did not see it. I did not see it the way he treated the thief on the cross. I did not see it in the way that he he cared for the blind and the sick, the leopard. I did not see it the way he spoke to the rich young ruler. Like I can go through story after story. There was always a level of accountability, but was always met with a level of love that led to correction. Um, So like, what do you do? What do you say? Like, I can't say that I have the clear answer as a as in form of an absolute like absolutely here's what you should say and absolutely here's what you need to say and absolutely here's what you need to do and if you don't you're a part of the problem um i would like to see the conversation the hosp- the hostility the volatility behind the conversation to change so that people can feel the freedom to speak to hear to listen and i would say listen twice as much as you are speaking yes i'm all about that but so that when, you, when your voice is found in this issue, you actually feel the freedom to say it without feeling like you will instantly be condemned if what the words that come out are, are, are somehow separated from the heart in which you meant them. Meaning like, here's, meaning like if someone comes and says like, man, I don't see color, brother. Like, man, we're the same, we're, we're the same in Christ. It's not about you being black, it's not you being white, that I don't pop off. And be like, dude, that is such a racist statement. I'm a black man. You need to see me as being black. And because of that, you're racist. You're part of the problem. You don't even, like, I can either pop off like that and then shut that person down, make them feel like I can't say anything. I can't express my support in any way because if I'm not up to date on what is the best, most politically correct way to say it, then I'm just not going to. Or I can say, man, I appreciate you. Man, I see your heart. I see. Here's what I hear you saying with your heart is that you see me in a way that you see all. You want to treat me with the same level of love and respect that you treat anyone, black or white. Let me help you with that. Just say that because I do also need you to see my color. I do also need you to see me as a black man. I love being black. <laughs> I, why? Because God made me that way, not because I feel like being black makes me better than you or you being white makes you better than me um this is the way that god created a like have a flipping conversation um that leads it can't stop at a conversation hear that it can't just stop at a conversation it has to lead to action after every conversation like after this conversation that we're having both of us as brothers as friends as pastors as leaders need to walk away from this conversation saying how did this conversation make me different how am I going to live my life differently now? How can I bless the black community? Like if it doesn't lead to action that leads to change, then we're just going for a walk. Yeah. We're not moving anything forward. It's, and, and you doing this is an action step that I believe is going to lead for, to change for those in your church. You're saying, I don't want to just talk about it. I want to be about it. So then I, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm a person listening to this at True Life Church, I need to walk away with, what am I going to do differently now that I know what I know? And if I need help figuring that out, who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to gather around me? Who are the black people in my community that I need to ask more questions and that I need to listen and really listen? And when they share something that stirs me, that kind of makes me feel, as we say, some kind of way about it, meaning like a little like, ugh. That's hard to hear. That's not who I am. That doesn't represent me. I'm not right. Like when my defenses go up, take a deep breath, (sighs) take in what they're saying and, and see if there is some truth in it for you. I shared this with you the other day when we were on the phone, um, just 
being real, raw, real, and vulnerable, the level of systemic racism that even invades me as a black man and how I see my own people. I shared the example that if I was walking down um, a parking garage at Santa Monica, a place that we visit a lot, um, and I had my kids with me, and there was a black young man in the middle of the night in a hoodie walking towards me, my heart would race a little bit more than if it was a white brother walking towards me. I would feel a little less threatened by a white man in a dark alley than a black man in a dark alley. And I'm black! And I know that this is just a brother, that there is no, there is no sin in being born black. And because you're black doesn't mean you're a criminal. But because of the way that our society has, has, has portrayed people of color, black men, and seeing those images throughout my entire life, even though I have more experience to combat that notion that black people are criminals than I do have those images that they are, even though I have all that understanding within myself from my own life experience as a black man, Systemic racism has been so integrated into the way that I was brought up and the way that I saw black people that my heart would physically race more quickly from seeing the sight of a black man as a threat. That breaks my heart because that black man is me. That black man is my son. And we are not a violent threat. We are men of God who love God, who wanna bring peace um, but that is the true reality that has got to change. And so how does that change? It changes as we start seeing black men for who they are, who God created them to be. And we start changing the narrative. Can we start celebrating the work of black, the black people? Can we start making sure that there are more stories out there of them winning than them losing? Because there are. The world would like you to believe that they're not. The world would like you to believe, and I'm sorry, I hate to speak in overgeneralization. So let me, let me pull back a little bit. From what I have seen, there are more stories of black criminality out there than there are story of black Christianity. There are more stories of black men causing harm than there are stories of black men doing good. We have to change that. There are more stories of the person in all black robbing my house than there are stories of that black brother who helped me start my car, who helped shop for the elderly, who, who helped you know, advance a cause for Christ or justice. And those stories need to be told. How about we start making an intentional effort to tell those stories? That's good. All right, last question. What if you have a relationship with a black person, white person, friends like we are, you see something that you, you think is, a, is, you see something that's wrong, but you don't just think it's wrong. You think it's racially motivated. And I don't, and I'm white. And I'm like, dude, I like, like George Floyd and, and what happened to Ahmaud Arbery is so, you know, it's like, obvious and clear but what if there's another situation whether it's on the news or it happens to you and or we're together and we go to a restaurant and um somebody's rude to you and you're like see that's because i'm black and i'm like is it is it okay as a white person to be like mm, i don't know if i agree i think she was rude to me too and it looked like she was rude to i don't know if it's because you race maybe you because you're like is it okay to push back sometimes and go i don't think that was a racial thing wrong that was wrong but i don't know if that was racially motivated I would say in the wisdom of the sign of these times, um, with as, as volatile as this issue is right now, you really have to lean into what is, and I said this term earlier in, the, in our talk, the equity of your relationship. Meaning, if it was you and I, you can say that. We have, we have 20 years, essentially, of history. Um, and, and where it, you, we very much understand each other we're best friends, we get it, we, we talk all the time. Um, there, there is not a risk per se of it blowing up into becoming something that is deeply offensive to the person of color. Um, I would say to that white person, if you do not have that relational equity, um, just because you have an opinion doesn't necessarily mean you need to voice it. Just because it per is permissible doesn't mean it's, next, it's actually preferable or beneficial. 
Um, and so, and I, I weigh the same things when coming into conversations with other people of color um, that, that, that may be more educated on an issue or may see some very same footage. And I, as a black man, think, I'm not sure if that's actually about, about racism. Like I've had those thoughts and I'm in a conversation with people within my own black community who feel very passionate that it was. And I don't have that relationship. I'm not saying nothing. And I don't, I don't want to feel bad about like, well, aren't you not standing up for justice? Are you not? I look at it this way. Is what I'm saying actually going to bring solution to the situation? Like, no, I'm not in law enforcement. I don't sit on a, a, like I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a judge. Like me weighing in on this is not necessarily going to change the outcome of the, of, of the situation. And it may cause further damage to the relationship that I have. And it may be seen as diminishing that person's pain and not being willing to sit there and mourn with them in that pain. If I'm asked directly, I'm, I'm going to respond according to the conscious that God has given me. I'm not going to lie about it. I'm going to give. But if, if it is not asked of me and I know it's contrary to what this person firmly believes and they're going to take it as frankly racist, insensitive, or, or out of touch or whatnot or anything and only going to escalate the issue, wisdom tells me, do I, do I need to say it? That is a conversation I need to have with the Holy Spirit in the moment. Like it's something like as a father that I tell my kids, like just because you have an opinion doesn't mean you have the right to voice it. Let's get rid of this entitlement um, aspect of some of our culture, dare I say, that says like as a red-blooded American, I have the right to my opinion. I have the freedom of speech. I have the right to say whatever I want. I'm like, yeah, you do. But you're also responsible for the consequence of your voice. And so then if you're going to say that, you have to be willing to live with the results of that. If you're going to say that, you better be willing to live with the consequence of this person calling you a racist, this person blasting you on social media, this person possibly damaging your reputation with others in the black community who you've built relationship and trust with. Was it worth it just to stand and say, I don't think that was about race. And if it's not, maybe it's not the right time for you to voice it. Maybe there is another way or another platform in which you can do in which you can do so. And that just isn't the time. It's good. That's helpful. So, I mean, so back to like, choose, choose, choose empathy first and yeah. lamenting and mourning first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Can you pray for our church as we, as we are a community in the suburbs of the Jersey shore? Um, <laughs> yeah. Trying to navigate, trying to navigate this. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, almighty God. Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, Wonderful Counselor, the one who calls us his friend. Spirit of God, I just invite you right now, God, into this holy moment. The idea that you've got two brothers right here seeking for your will and your way mm. in such a volatile time around such mm. a very complicated, complex evil, racism. Father, I can't help but think that you're sitting up there and that you are just blessed that we're willing to wade into these deep waters with you. And I just lift up my man, my brother, my friend, Chris Francis and Jessica and, and True Life Church and all the leaders, all the attenders, everyone who is in your house, who is listening at this moment. We thank you, God, for their lives. I thank you for the way that you've created them. Beautiful in every way, in every shade, in every color. We thank you, God, that that is on purpose. That is by your design. And it is your desire that your children will come together in unity, that they would come together under your new command, John 13, 34, to love one another just as you have loved us. There are no exemptions to that verse. There, there, there's no getting out of it. He, he doesn't say, except when they're different from you, except when they believe different than you. Mm. 
except when they hold a different stance on an issue than you. You still call us to love one another as you've loved us. And so, Father, I pray that in this season that you give True Life Church supernatural wisdom. This is not easy. These are not fun times in many ways. But I believe and I pray, God, that we can rest in your refuge. We can rest in your strength. We can rest knowing, God, that as we seek your will, your way, and your heart, that you will lead us, that you will guide us, and that you will show us the way to everlasting peace, not just on the other side of eternity, but in the here, here and in the now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, we thank you for our daily blessings. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And we thank you, God, that you've equipped us and brought us to be for such a time as this, God. Yeah. You plucked us out of eternity and placed us in the present day so that we could do your work in the here, in the now, right now, 2020, in the middle of racial crisis, in the middle of a global viral pandemic. You brought us here. And you said, I need you to shine, shine for me. And may we do that, Father. And may we bring you glory through it all. In Jesus' name, amen.